Okay, so to kick this off, I'm very excited to have Ms. Davis with us today. She's an alumni of Port Wainimi. Um, she is currently the Executive Director of NAVSI Systems Command Industrial Operations, or NAVSI-04, where she oversees and supports four public Navy shipyards, encompassing more than 37,000 civilian and military personnel, executing major maintenance and modernization availabilities on U.S. Navy submarines, aircraft carriers, and supporting the surface ship maintenance. She's held many, many important positions um, in her career, Executive Director, PEO Aircraft Carriers, Director for Surface Warfare, Office of Undersecretary of Secretary for, of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment Platform and Weapons Portfolio Management Office. That's a big, that's a lot. Executive Director, Joint Special Operations Command in Fort Braggs, North Carolina. Executive Director, PEO the USC, or Unmanned and Small Combatants, Executive Director for Surface Warfare at Navy Sy Naval Sea Systems Command, and Director of Integrated Combat Systems, PEO IWS. Did I miss any? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Karen actually joined our command at PhD in 1988 and has the distinction of being the command's and possibly NAVC's first female shipwriter when she was a project engineer supporting sea squats. She was a, one of the, the initial members of the Federal Women's Program back in the day at Point Wainimi, which led the way for many engineers, women engineers, a PhD for her groundbreaking efforts. So she's a perfect one, I think, to open up uh, this conference. Um, and it gives, gives me great pleasure to introduce Ms. Karen Davis. So I hate podiums, y'all. <laughs> and so I'm sorry to the man uh, who's in charge of the camera. Just let me know if I messed up too badly. So, so when, when um, Jeff talked about ship riding, Bernadette building a wave at that time, Blix, now, right? So Bernadette was at sea with me a lot. Um, Cindy, who I she's probably retired by now, how many folks are here from the days when we were doing C squats back on the CGs. I know Bernadette. Who else? How, who was here at Norton Sound when we were testing Aegis? <laughs> so we're the, we're the goats. <laughs> <laughs> the old folk. It, really? Is it just us three? Anybody else here from Norton Sound days? Even at Dahlgren Division, we had a lot of folks back then. That's amazing. That says something about the I guess our age, at least. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, I've been back here. I left in 98 um, through Commander's Development Program, which is now CEFP. And I will tell you, I'm disappointed in how many people are not using those venues now to get that opportunity to go to uh, NAVC headquarters and to kind of see how things are run out in that radius stuff from here, 3,000 plus miles of, of D.C., why is that important? Because the Pentagon, oh, we can't, um, thank you so much. The Pentagon, um, it's, it's a five-sided building that inside of is a lot of people who affect, you know, what happens uh, in your daily professional lives. And so there's a lot of programs. I'm not going to harp on that. But there are some programs that as you think about the graduation of this time you're investing, uh, today, there's a lot of opportunities to rotationally, uh, maybe even long-term assignments, whatever that looks like, think about how big is this oyster that I'm a part of. So I just want to put a plug in that for that and go back to, to where I was originally, which is CDP is what led me to go to D.C. Um, now, truth in advertising, about 10 months after being there, I was crying, so I need to go back. But, <laughs> but one of my friends like, are you crazy? Don't you see X, Y, and Z? And so um, I, I uh, persevered. CDP was three years at that time. CFP, I think, is closer to, to two, maybe two and a half years now. But for three years of um, my early career, when I transitioned from Warnemi, I actually got to discover the capital, National Capital Region. And so um, I encourage you to use some of these opportunities. I think bridging the gap is one. There's the uh, 
journeyman program. There's, there's lots of programs, and frankly, I think the Warfare Center has a pretty robust uh, set of relationships where you can see a little bit beyond, you know, your um, perch of what's going on in the, the Navy that you are making a difference in. So, so anyway, so I was at Wanimi, um, from, um spent a year in industry, and um, I'm telling you this because part of, of the discussion of my journey a lot of what I think shaped me occurred at Port Wainimi from a professional perspective. So um, I came here after a year in industry. I was, I'm a South Carolinian. And um, I moved here. And I worked for folks at Sandor Giesinger, who's passed, Juan Camacho, who I think is uh, maybe in the contracting area here, people like Noel Kamenak, which I think uh, he wanted to be one of your uh, folks over in your front office. Um, so we were Norton Sound, uh, bringing Aegis to life, and all those things when I was a young person. And one of the things that I learned back then was I wasn't learning a lot in the office. You actually had to get out there and touch the product, live in the environment that you think the sailors are thriving in, learn what it's like to have the whole of CIC come down to the computer room and look at the gear because it ain't working. You had to actually see what was happening with this code that we were delivering um, to these sailors who at that time were my age, but now are the ages of my sons. And so um, it was important to me to get out there. And so when Jeff talked about being an early ship rider, back then um, the cruisers were not modified for women. So we stayed usually in the Embark Commander stateroom, and which was a C-squat office during the day, and the back part was uh, some birthing. When we had more than one woman, we may get medical as our facility, but then if something happens in the night, you got to get out of there. And occasionally we might get a two- or three-man stateroom if you had, you know, at least maybe two or three other women. And so um, those were good days, but... You had people, again, like Juan and Sandor, who were sending women to sea in an environment where it was not necessarily accommodating for us. And I wrote a pamphlet called the Embarkation Denial Pamphlet. Why is that? Because I was all the way in, in Puerto Rico at Rosie Roads when it was open, and a silver ship decided to tell me I couldn't get, he wasn't going to go in the way with me. <laughs> like, do you know how far it is from Port Wainimi to here? <laughs> or are we getting on the way? <laughs> or are you going to sign this embarkation denial form? I got on the way. So when I came back, I said, I'm going to write a pamphlet so that every woman who goes out and has that same scenario to play, there was an official form, believe it or not. So uh, in one of our... Um, Prevention of Sexual Harassment Stand Downs, I think uh, Charlie Giacci was the ED, or maybe Joe Cipriano at the time. We handed that out to all of the command. If you are denied embarkation, know this form number. So those were the days that we grew up in. So great time in Aegis and uh, transitioned to passive countermeasure systems and um, was a team leader and a guy named Mark Dusk, who's probably not here anymore either. Um, but I think that PCMS team, some of those folks, who, is anyone here from the PCMS team? Top side signatures? No, that was a good team. But that was my first um, team leader job. And then I went on to be a branch head at SSDS, which at that time was 4Y. I'm sure it's something different now. But again, worked for a great person at that time, Mark Johnson, who, you know, at that point was trying to transition me to thinking about the fact that in a working capital fund activity, at that time, I think we were still called DBOF, um, every person working has to have a job order number to charge to. So it started me thinking about the business side of, of how we manage, uh, forming relationships with headquarters and those sorts of things. But by then, I was a mother. And I had to make decisions about, am I going to go to sea or, and, and do those things, or should I you know, try to make a transition and uh, be at home more. And so that's when I went into uh, my first branch head job. And um, 
I'll tell you guys a secret. One morning, and I bet you someone in here can relate to this. I had one sick kid. I had, my sons are 16 months apart. I had one sick kid and one well kid. One could go to daycare, one could not. I had to brief uh, the ship, the uh, station CO on the results of a C squat, but I had a kid that was sick. Anybody have that happen to them? <laughs> so you know what I did? I cried. In my car with the well kid in daycare and the sick kid in his car seat, I sat there and I cried. And then it came to me, wait a minute, Miss Mays from church told me, because I went to Bethel AME at the time, Miss Mays told me if I ever need help, I better call her. And I did. And I said, well, he has a fever. She says, oh, yeah, my grandbaby's in town. I said, he has a fever. She says, you don't think I know how to take care of kids? <laughs> I was like, okay. So I, had, I called on that network to help me at a time where professionally I was having an opportunity to brief for one of the first times in my career by myself the outcome of my project, and my kid was sick. And as, as mothers, those of you who are mothers, if you're grandmothers, aunts, what anyone, even uh, single dads or married dads, if you've ever had that dilemma, raise your hand. Okay, so I'm in good company. But it says something about our journey and what we must do. We must have a network that we trust, especially when it comes to the fact that if you travel, you have to have a network for your kids. And I say this in this forum because even though today I may be standing here as an SCS, the reality is I came through an interesting um, life journey because I'm a daughter, I'm a mother, I was a wife, I'm a professional, I'm a friend, I'm all those things that you are, which says that if I can be here, so can you, right? Um, or wherever you are, there's someone who's looking and aspiring to be where you are. So at, at, um, at um, headquarters, I was at the time that I was the Women's Employee Resource Group champion, we had a lot of folks who wanted to have uh, panels where the SES were focused. And my thing was, between the band two, band three, the GS 12, 13, and SES, is a lot of good people and a lot of good jobs. And you don't necessarily make that jump without, you know, visiting and performing in some of those jobs. So I made it a practice, and I still do of emphasizing the fact that there's a lot in between where you may be today and where you may be, you know, fast forward to where you're going. And part of, of that is recognizing that you got to spot some people along the way who may not be SES. Frankly, the Navy right now, we're at 300 is our number in terms of the SES slots throughout the entire, and I think that's Department of Navy, which includes Marine Corps, of course. So... If we have, what, 230,000, someone do some math, please. If we have 230,000 Navy civilians approximately, and of those, 300 slots are SES, what's that math? I don't want to do it publicly, but it's point oh oh something, right? Sorry? Point one three Of the population is SES. Now, it doesn't mean that number won't grow, but that's just where it is today. And it doesn't mean you can't be one of that point one so much as you have to be deliberate about it. And oh, by the way, that point one, when you go to the 15 band fours, that's a little bit bigger. 14 control point band fours, that's a little bigger. So that's what I'm saying. Everything is not there instantaneously. There's a lot of good stuff going on in between. And one of the things I know is that on my journey, and, and I live it every day, you're only as good as the people who work for you. Without good people and without dedicated people, without people who won't get distracted by, you know, the churn or get caught up in the churn, and churn can be many things. It could be churn that we created. 
it could be churn that we choose to be a part of. But I'm only as good as the people that work for me. And let me tell you, I just got off a call. And I recommend not doing calls before important things like this. <laughs> um, and it's an important call, which is why, of course, I t- took part in it. But on that call, I just recognized, oh, my God, thank God so-and-so is on this call because um, I don't think these numbers are right, number one. But I know that he knows these numbers. And I was chatting him, chime in, chime in. <laughs> he was like, he said, I'm sorry, I was trying to get off of, out of chatting back into the call. I was like, God speak. And so I was dependent on him, right? So, again, don't. Don't think that the SCS is, is an arrival. It is a greater point of dependency on excellent people than ever um, I have experienced. So anyway, back to my journey. I think my, I actually looked up um, more on um, the Executive Women in Motion uh, project from OPM. And uh, a friend of mine, Zena Zolch, Zolch, who works at, um, she was at Agriculture. She's now at OPM. I listened to her speech when they did this uh, back when she was at OPM. And she talked about her personal journey, um, children, um, all the things that she was wrestling with professionally. So the intent is to be a little bit transparent, and I will try to be reasonably transparent. So after Port Wainimi, I had a three-year-old and two-year-old packed up the Volvo and moved across the country with them to D.C. And uh, my three-year-old, who's now my 28-year-old, he, he was our uh, alarm clock. After being in the car for too long, Mommy, it's time to get a hotel. <laughs> and he used to say, buy a hotel. Mommy, time to buy a hotel. Um, but I, I came a little bit um, nervous, but not afraid. And so um, got to um, headquarters, did the CDP. Um, let me tell you, what was the best thing about CDP for me was I accepted a rotation. I actually applied. This was one of the most coveted rotations. I applied for a six-month rotation inside of Dads and Ships. Anybody here know Allison Stiller? I'm going to mention some of my heroes as I go. I want you to look up Allison Stiller. She was... Um, Dads in ships for a long time. Before that, she was inside of PO ships and uh, maybe even PO Tad and some other places. She came out of the submarine world, so she was also in PO uh, when Virginia was being designed. Um, Allison was the type, I remember I had to write some legislation once. At least she told me I had to write some legislation once. And I was like, Allison, I. I've never written legislation. She said, well, the lawyers are next door. That was what she gave me. And we were successful. No coddling, no feeling like, oh, my God, I can't do it. It was an opportunity. And so I learned to look at challenges as I don't have to, but I have the opportunity to. And I learned a lot uh, in my early time with Allison for only six months. And she was a staff officer inside of Dads and Ships when a man named Mike Thomas was the Dazen. And uh, she later on became the Dazen and invited me back full time on her staff. So those six months meant something for my career. I could take it as I'm here for six months, let me make coffees and copies, or I could say, give me something hard to do. And I know I hadn't been in Washington before, but I'll figure it out. And that's what Allison did. And she went on again to be just a, a, a great. Um, um, impact on my career. And the other thing I'll say about Allison is she got selected when she was on staff to, to go to Harvard for that 10-week program, and I was a CD peer. And so as a CD peer, you cover the desk of whoever it is that you uh, may be working for. So she was on her way to Harvard, and I said, Allison, are we going to do a turnover? She said, yeah, here's my parking pass. See you in 10 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and that I, say, I laugh at it, but that's what we did. Here's my parking pass. See you in 10 weeks. Don't get towed. So here's, and that was it. And I loved those 10 weeks. 
because Allison wasn't calling, helicopter, and she wasn't doing anything but allowing me to strive. So how many of you have people who come to you and maybe you give them an assignment, but you hover? Or you ask them every day, how's it going? Will we be honest and raise our hands? If you're hovering over people, I'll tell you from my seat, she, she elected not to do that, but I didn't need it because my desire was to do well. And so, uh, again, that was, that was the most impactful time when I was in CDP was when I had the opportunity to work for a future leader. And I've been very strategic. I'm an introvert. I've gotten better over the years. But when I first went there, I was eye off the chart. At DAU, they called me up front and said, hey, if the boss just um, said the project's finished early and um, it's time to go celebrate, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go home and finish my wallpaper project. <laughs> <laughs> and I put the Lion King in and let my kids do that. I'm going to wallpaper. I thought that was, they were like, okay, that's why we called you up. They called another guy up and uh, they said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go to a bar. I'm going to talk to every woman in the bar. And said, that's why we called you up. Because we tested just off the chart, me, I, he, e. Why is that important? Because I was an I. And as an I, I had to try to come out of that, that. How many I's do we have, introverts? And that's not unusual, especially uh, for engineers and technical types. It's not unusual. But it's, and it's okay. But what do you do to help yourself selectively go to that E place. And when you do go to that E place, give yourself permission to recenter and now go back to your natural zone. But you got to come out of the I. So I, I had a hard time coming out of the I. So I had a very, very small group of leaders that I would go to. I wasn't the type that would get on calendars and go visit people. I couldn't bring myself out of that place. I can now to a degree, but I still work on it. It's not my natural place. Um, so anyway, the, um, after CDP, I went to, uh, went to, did some rotations at CDP. Um, and at the end of CDP, I selected aircraft carriers because I knew they had jobs that were going to be open. So there, there's another hint in there. If you're ever rotating about and you're in a program or something where you want to, you're going to have to land a job when you finish, Make that last rotation a place where you know people are actually hiring people. There's a lot of hiring going on right now, but <laughs> under normal circumstances, maybe there's not as many vacancies as we see now. And so when you plan your, what you're going to do, think about places where they're actually hiring people. And you go in and you make an impression, and maybe you get one of those good opportunities that they have. So that's what I did at the end of CDP, went into carriers, came out, um, I actually um, ended up having to deliver a vessel that I hadn't worked on, and that gave me some interesting experience was delivering a carrier. Um, and I actually began to like the shipbuilding world. I was a combat system person, but I started to enjoy shipbuilding, went to... Um, back to the Pentagon to represent aircraft carriers and big deck amphibs by that time on the DAS and staff, as I said, when uh, Allison was over there. And then from there was selected to the deputy program manager job. And why is that important? Because in there is where I made decisions about, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to be an SCS? After the things I saw inside the Pentagon, um, is that what I want to do? And so I did. And um, to make a long story short, the... Um, Aircraft carrier deputy program manager job was probably one of the better things that I've done in my career because, again, when you get to those ACAT 1 acquisition category 1D opportunities and you're being pulsed consistently by OSD and others, you kind of get to see how defense works. Um, and honestly, other than uh, some of the mechanics inside the Pentagon of, of large acquisition programs, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, and I think the thing that made me all the better was the fact that I had spent 10 years at a warfare center understanding the product. And I think um, while it's not required, 
it absolutely um, should be something that we look for in our leaders. Have you ever had to live with what you are given to the capital? Remember, Arlie Burke said capital S for sailors, the capital S sailor. The sailor is the center of the universe, right? And so um, sometimes it's one of the things I think about is, have you ever had to live with how you affect I'll just say the warfighter, because with, with, with the special ops, the warfighter. Um, and if that answer is a no, I, it's kind of interesting to me. I just think it's so important. So fast forward, um, went to uh, Marine Corps Systems Command because my kids were in high school and I wanted to be a little bit closer to home. My commute was like 50-something miles one way. Made a decision to move closer in because once again... The two little boys, the one that was sick that day and the one that was well, those two uh, remain the center of a lot of my decision making. They're adults now, but at that time in high school, I made a decision. And um, I share with you that because my piece of advice is when you come to a fork, take it. I was at a fork. Do I stay where I am or and continue what I think is a path to becoming an SES, or do I take the fork where, that, the other uh, fork where I'm going to go down to Mark or Syscom and be uh, at every after-school activity because they were doing high school things. They were learning to drive. They were dating. They were getting ready for college. And so I made a career decision to do that. That was hard for me because I thought I was going to take myself off the beaten path. To get to um, the point, I did not. And why did I not? Because even as an introvert, I had two SCS who, before I went down, I said, hey, can you guys keep an eye on opportunities for me? I got to go do this, but I don't want to get out of the lineup. I was honest and transparent with them. I want to do this. And they were human enough to say, okay, let us see how we can help you. How many people here ask for help when you need it? Don't stop doing that. Because that could be the game changer. And sometimes it's not even help, it's just good advice. But just make sure it's someone who has good advice. (laughs) That's why my circle was small, because not everybody has good advice. Um, So anyway, went went there, and because of a relationship, I was asked to come back to the Navy. After my, my youngest son was graduated from high school in June, in May, I was asked to come back up north. So when me... So a mixture of God and these SES I had asked to help me, there I was headed back a month earlier than I planned. But to me, that's on the mark, right? And then I went to black programs for a while, and then from there became an SES uh, inside of IWS, which took me back to combat systems after all of that, back to combat systems. Um, Admiral Hill, who's MDA now, selected me into the SES um, remember those people along the way who, you know, they don't not do you a favor. I would never call it that, but who put confidence in their selection of you. There's a lot of voices at the table. There's a decision maker. So just um, it's, there's nothing wrong with uh, this remembering those people. And maybe, um, you know, whether they're in the room or not, they played a role. So I appreciate Admiral Hill. Um, after the, I was happy in IWS and, uh, the command had a need and Admiral Hilarides and Bill Delight at the time came and said, Hey, we need you to move over to C-21. I was like, Oh no, thank you. I'm happy in IW. I'm back to combat systems. I'm happy. So they made it seem like it was a question, (laughs) (laughs) but I was reassigned. I was, they call it reverse slating. I was reverse slated to go um, and work still surface ships, but from the maintenance side. Um, Best thing they could have ever um, voluntold me to do. Three years, that was when uh, Fitzgerald had the collision, uh, McCain. That was my office um, under myself, Admiral Downey, that um, did the EOC and and the uh, work of getting that repair uh, work, of course, with a lot of people, uh, CO2, CO5, ton of folks uh, from uh, NAVC. But 
How many times in your career do you get to, first of all, God forbid we see things like that happen that close together, but how many times do you get to play in that arena? So it ended up being, again, a good voluntold thing to do. From there, I was, um, I went to USC. Every so often, this is another thing, too, that maybe you can think about as you think about whether or not you want to become SCS. Not always, but sometimes you do get reverse slate to go do things that maybe you never even thought about. Those can be good because you, 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 don't, ha- you don't own a comfort zone. You kind of return to the Navy, that which they've invested in you, right? And um, you can do that from any place. Has anyone ever asked you to go take on a challenge? And you say, no, that's not really what I do. Or, you know, just kind of, you don't have to answer that, but just think about it. Sometimes when your organization needs you to go do something else, um, it's not always about you. It may be about the organization. And I'm a, I'm a living witness to sometimes it's about the organization. And by accepting that challenge, you grow. Because if I hadn't accepted C21, not that I had a choice, but if I hadn't, then I don't think I would have grown the way I, I have in some ways. But we sign mobility agreements, and those are not those are not exercised in anything I think that's adverse. But if even though they phrase it as a question, I don't think I could have turned down the opportunity because I said I'm I'm your asset. And so that is an aspect of when you think about SCS, read up on it at, at OPM's website and just kind of know uh, the five ECQs, the pro from Dover, uh, Diane's going to Miss Coslo is going to talk about that. But those ECQs, I actually started writing to them when I applied for CDP. They don't only apply to the SCS, they apply to your career. And so she's going to talk about those, but think about them as you uh, develop your resume, as you write about yourself. Think about leading teams, leading change, or leading people, leading change, building coalitions, your business acumen. Business is, is not just people and money, it could be IT. So she's going to walk this through. And then, then what are the results you're getting? And so that's going to be a great item to pay attention to because you can start that writing right now. You should be already reflecting that when you write about yourself. Um, so on to uh, 21, went to, uh, left the Navy altogether. I don't know why. I just said, you know, I want to try to, I want to, actually I wanted to get my joint tour. Uh, because we every year look at our talent management. How many, how many of you look at your annual, uh, you look at your IDP, but how many of you look at it from the perspective of managing yourself and your talent? Well, they look at us through different lenses. They come up with, um, you know, what jobs do you seem like a good fit for where your interests are? How many of you have done a 360 assessment? Great. For us, we're supposed to do it every three years. Um, so, just kind of start to use those tools that we already use as you think about your career now and those things that you think about as you advance. So then I went to the Army um, in a joint billet because my talent management um, tool kind of led me to think about I haven't done a joint tour. I didn't think they would select me, but they did. I don't know why I didn't think that because I had never been in that part of the uh, defense uh, mission set, but they did. My boss was an Air Force three-star. And I had a blast. It was great. Uh, But during COVID, I felt like, all right, so I was there before COVID, but then COVID uh, hit. And uh, I'm not a resident in that area. My sons are up here. My family's in South Carolina. I was like, I think I'm going to go back to Northern Virginia. So anyway, um, aircraft carriers, back to my home, back to a boss I had worked for. And then I got tapped again. And... um, I think I may have had a choice, but this is one where <laughs> I didn't even exercise the no. I was like, okay, wherever you guys need me, I'll go. So that's why I'm now, I'm the executive director for industrial operations. And, and under that is all the naval shipyards. And you can read about how much work is uh, occurring right now relative to naval shipyards, in particular with uh, getting submarines through and out for tasking and adding back to fleet ace above. Uh, aircraft carrier availabilities, but also um, we have the supervisor of shipbuilding. So supervisors of shipbuilding oversee the administration of our shipbuilding contracts, and so that's under 
our portfolio as well. So I have the yards and I have uh, the supervisors. I'm in that job six months now, and um, I probably am the most uh, sleepless that I've been in a while um, because the job is a big job. I enjoy it, but it's a big job because in addition to my job, I am a NAFC asset. I do the African American Employee Resource Group. I, um, when we were kind of stalled out on a hiring event, I told leadership and another one of my heroes, Ms. Fan, who um, was also at DAS and back when um, I was there with Allison, um, if you need help, I'll do it. And um, I told myself, and I was the program management functional area um, lead when we transitioned to back to basics. And so I, I actually, honestly, I told Ms. Fan, I'm going to give up something because I want to have more time to focus on this thing that you guys really moved me to focus on. But I say to you that um, even here at Wainimi, those collateral responsibilities were huge to me. Federal Women's Program, um, was that was a big deal. Uh, I think Liz Awa Dubois, who's not here today, she and I worked heavily on that. She sent me a picture last night uh, of some, some things that were in some local publication of the work we were doing at FWP. So... Um, Always look for that extracurricular opportunity uh, because they're needed. We need events like this, right? But they don't occur unless someone raises their hand and say they'll do it. We talked about the, who was the volunteer that raised their hand earlier. Raise your hand because without those opportunities, we can't put on events like today. So um, I wrote a couple of things I wanted to share with you, and then I'm going to uh, open up for a few questions, and I'm going to get the hook off the stage here. Um, replace, replace the phrase I have to with I get to or I have the opportunity to. Not everyone gets a trophy on every occasion. Learn to celebrate others. And frankly, learn to celebrate yourself. Deion Sanders, as much as he has a lot of that showmanship, the primetime thing, you know what at the core of it is? He says, I like to celebrate myself. <laughs> you know, it's, that's, not, that's not bad because I tell you this, when you get ready to write your ECQs, and again, Diane's going to hit it, but if you don't know how to write about yourself, it's the one time we say that it's okay to talk about I versus we the team, because no one wants to hear about the team when it, that package gets to the QRB. They got to know what have you done. So um, as you go along, jot down some things about yourself. Celebrate yourself. Um, have standards and require the people in your life to have some as well. Why do I say that? Most of you have some level of security clearance, I presume. And the uh, the best way to not have that any longer is to not have standards. So for me, that's one of my, that's like a big deal for me, is, um, is the standards. Um, I hope you get this when I say it. Don't compare the speed of your life to Amazon Prime, to a microwave, or the air fryer. Anything that's meant for convenience. It may not be the most convenient climb for you. Maybe you're going to take a route like I took, which is Navy, Marine Corps, Army, back to Navy, or even at OSD. You know, it may not be, you know, <laughs> my sons told me, you, the air fryer works better than a microwave. And so I believe them. So that's why I put the, the air fryer in there, because I think most people use air fryers now to warm things up, and that, so they don't come like too hot to, out too hot to eat anyway. Hey, here's one I hope you already know about. Recognize counterfeit behaviors. How many of you have read about counterfeit behaviors? I'll give you an example. Oh, you just got hired at OPM to be their lead for, I don't know, uh, HR. You think that's, are you ready for that? <laughs> I, I've heard terrible things. About, or... You just got, oh, my God, he come see me because I have some ideas. I know some people over there that can help you get acclimated. Which one of those is counterfeit? Number one. 
So recognize when people are really not, you know, that's, that's, don't tell me anything. Don't pour that negativity in. That's counterfeit to me. And if you, as you become more aware of get real, get better, uh, the CNO's concepts in there, uh, over time we'll learn about counterfeit behaviors. But be careful of those because when you're celebrating, you want people to not be so elated they don't see your challenge, but they want you, you want them to say, let me help you, as opposed to, are you sure you can do that? Um, I already said you're only as good as your people. Um, you got anybody who watch uh, Abbott Elementary? Okay, so my son's turned me on. I love that show. I binge watched it over the holidays, season one, and they're on season two. But it says uh, 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 Quinta Bronson, she, when she interviewed with Oprah, she talked about the failures that she had before Abbott Elementary. And she said that every failure was an opportunity. And so uh, failure gives you another direction, another direction and more options. So um, just another thought. And then um, strike a balance between caring uh, about others and caring about yourself. And you can take that for what it's worth. Just, just don't forget that somewhere in this equation, your wholeness and, and how you feel, how you celebrate you and all those things, as your journey to uh, becoming an SCS, a leader, whatever your goal is, um, you matter as well. So just make sure you figure out how to uh, not be perfect. I'll tell you, the, I'm the first one who doesn't know a thing about work-life balance. Um, It just has never worked for me. Um, So which is why, again, geographically, I may place myself somewhere where it adds to my ability to do it better, to do it better. But, um, yeah, you know, just take care of yourself. I always tell my folks, give yourself some grace. You won't get it right, but you probably will learn a lot. You won't get it right every time, but you will learn. So give yourself some grace. Okay, so that's enough about me. Um, Unless there's any particular questions, I will open up uh, for that, and then I'm going to get off the stage. Oh, I'm sorry, please. Yes, ma'am. So my counsel, when I was at C21, and I told her to ask me a good question, a nice question. Yeah, Tawana, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so C21, right? Um, My counselor. And I mean legal counsel, not, not my therapist, right? <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> but please go ahead. First, thank you. Oh, I'm allowed. Okay. <laughs> actually think that is, thank you so much. I actually think that's more than work-life balance that you're talking about, too. Those are actually life choices. Um, so, so I think we ought to distinguish those two things. What's a work-life balance issue and what's a life choice issue or opportunity? Um, so one thing is, I go back to those Covey principles 
Um, is there anyone here who's not familiar with Covey and his principles? So I encourage you to read about that because actually I think those are still um, used in the professional realm. There's lots of other schools of professional thought that exist. But Covey was the one that NAFC had invested in back in probably the late 90s, early 2000s, and a lot of training was around those. But one of them is the uh, deposits. Um, so a deposit says that when it's time to make a withdrawal, you're not going to exceed what you have available. So if, if you're an employee who, let's say you, you are a stellar performer, you have the relationship with your supervisor, for example, such that you need to do something different, your deposits should allow you to make that withdrawal when it's time. I think now the uh, rule sets that we live under uh, with OPM, they are getting friendlier and friendlier versus perhaps um, uh, when I came up. So sometimes, though, life choices, getting away from just balance stuff and into choices, says I have to go somewhere else um, because maybe I need a different type of pace at this point. And sometimes that's not mean leaving your command or your agency that could be going to another part of the agency uh, for, you know, a certain amount of time. Maybe there are other arrangements. I think what we maybe don't do the most effective job is of is sitting down and talking about how do we collectively make this work. And that's the opportunity. Uh, if I try to answer you more directly, that's the opportunity I think that could be missed is can we sit, like I told you, those two EDs, I'm an introvert, but can we sit and talk about what happens when I go 50 miles south and um, I don't want to get off this path that I'm on? So sometimes it's the humanness and that connection that we put ourselves out, and hopefully it gets received well. But when we're talking about no kidding what you're describing, which is, um, um, I call them again, life decisions, you got to sit and have those discussions with the people that help make uh, decisions around the career that you're vested in. But you can't, you, well, I shouldn't say you can't. It's harder if you need that support, but yet you know, maybe you're underperforming. Those are harder discussions. But when you're contributing and you're pulling your weight uh, and, and the organization, you know, is, a, is you know, you're, I don't want to say a friendly organization, but where we understand the tools that we have to work with people, I think you get different outcomes then. Yeah. But again, mobility, and it doesn't mean geographical mobility. It can mean mobility within your organization. Don't, don't be wed to one thing and doing one thing and one thing only. Please go ahead. You're welcome. Yeah, please. So the question is, how does like uh, tools like Max Telework help with? So, and that's one that honestly, Angie, Dr. Lewis had to ask answer for us at NAFC when she was acting C10. Max Telework, Telework, and remote work are all different things, and I think we've started to gray out remote and telework, whether it's Max or otherwise. And so, if you're talking about telework. Even if it's max telework, that doesn't take you out of the location or the radius that you were already living in. So if they need you in um, for an item, then that's what the telework, maximum or otherwise, does for us. And so, um, but I think it's, I don't know if it's a telework discussion. Telework is a tool. And how do I feel about it? I actually think that NAFC's telework policy that, that we're under is a very, um, we call it hybrid work environment. I actually think it's a great um, um, tool. Why do I think that? Because in our business, now people here, there's a whole lot of probably different, different competencies that are represented here. 
But let's just suppose you're a person whose job is to ride vessels. You can't necessarily do that from home, right? So somehow or another, making sure that our mission stays, you know, A1 is at the top of of a lot of of the decisions that we make. When I first came back and I was in carriers, I was reaching out to people because it was, uh, you know, it was... uh, 2021, yeah, 21, and um, there were people I had never seen before, and uh, coming aboard knew I wanted to chat with everybody, and here's what happens, though. I had a a young person, and I say young because she, maybe she's, she's a lot younger than me, but young professionally had come out of one of the intern programs. And she says, oh, yeah, I'm doing fine. I, I speak every day with the one other person that worked in her area. I said, well, who else? She said, that's it. Because under, under, you know, the environment that COVID had put us in, some folks had gone and were alone. And I don't know if we thrive best when you don't know how important your work is. You're not, in my eyes, none of my employees are transactions. Your work is never transactional. That's why we have our comptrollers, our legal counsels. Those folks go to ships, they go to sea, uh, because they need to understand the environment that they're supporting. So for me, I was concerned that, have you, and I asked, have you ever been on a, you know, CV and whatever? There's, no. So my fear or my concern is that had I as, and I'm like, at that time, maybe, three or four people before she gets to me, but because it's happened to randomly start calling employees, found out I have this person that um, is doing their daily job, but they're a little bit disconnected. We got to look at that. So I think uh, different, different discussion, different meeting. When we start talking about the telework thing, the remoteness of some of the decisions that we make, we might be losing some employees in the seams there, and they may not be, um, they might not even know that uh, they're in a scene. Leaders have to, it was, I didn't read it here, but one of my points was there's a difference between being a leader and leading. That's leading. You got to reach out and find these folks because tools that are meant to be positive could have an adverse effect of having people c- kind of out on their own and not really learning. So they too, fast forward 10 years from now when we, you know, COVID's a thing of the past. What's happening with their careers? Leaders need to be working on that right now. Um, ma'am. Well, I had good, so the question was, how do you make the mental shift when it's not your choice? And I actually was um, lucky to have a mentor who I had already had those conversations with before I became an SCS. Actually, I think when I signed the mobility agreement, I was like, are they really going to, yeah. And so he said, here are the three things. This was a a mentoring moment. Here are the three things I think you should, should know as you enter into the SCS. One about when do you move. One, when is your dream job? Two, when your company taps, when the organization taps you on the shoulder and says we need you. And then three, when is your retirement? (laughs) (laughs) And so I honestly, through that mentoring, was ready for the fact that, hey, he kind of told me one of these three things could happen. And it wasn't my dream job. But it did become one heck of a uh, opportunity for better things, which I didn't know was going to be the case. But his mentoring had already prepared me, so my mind was already in a place where if this happens, then you know, here's kind of my my three things. And it was the second one: you got the tap, and it was nothing about my, my mobility agreement. It was none of that stuff went through my mind so much as yeah. I, and I did say no the first time. Like, no, I'm good. Thank you. But 
Yeah. So it, it wasn't that hard for me. So, so what's, what's that say to everybody? Quality mentors will help prepare you for the fact that you're going to make some, you're going to come to some forks and they can't make the decision for you. But if they've in that relationship poured into you and have you prepare for these types of challenges that you will face, it won't be quite uh, the mental gymnastics because you're getting mentoring before you need it, before it's an emergency. Yes. Great question. Uh, any regrets of something I um, didn't do or didn't do sooner? So I'll to give you a current one. <laughs> I, honestly, I don't have a lot of regrets, but I do sometimes ask myself, hmm, was that the right you know, path I took? Um, at my last um, job, um, being alone a little bit down in uh, Carolina where I didn't have family, I was in between family. I could get and drive 200 miles to get to my sons and get to my birth family, to my parents. Um, but I asked myself, did I leave too soon because... Again, um, feeling a little bit isolated during COVID made me want to get back to where my family was. So I made a personal decision as much as a professional decision. And so um, sometimes I, you know, that was only, that's within the last five years. So sometimes I do ask myself, should I have stayed um, and persevered through the the isolation that I felt um, by being, you know, in a brand new not just a job. The job was good, but the city, everything was, was kind of new. No one was doing anything right. Um, and you, it's just one of those things I asked myself recently, was it a good decision uh, to do that? Because um, the things that I had made happen uh, at the organization were taking root. And, but here's the positive side of that. No matter where I go, and I'm actually working on it now, there's always someone that I see as, hey, if another opportunity comes or if they tap me on the shoulder, that person can act. So you never know when someone's interviewing you. And I'm always interviewing in my mind, hey, who could act if I'm not here? And so that helps me feel better, for example, because I had already, I knew who was going to be the right person for that position uh, if I ever left. And she later on was selected for the SES. Um, So if you are out, let's say you go on a cruise or vacation or something, how about give someone the opportunity to act in your job? Even if you are, you don't have to be the the leader uh, from the figurehead leader, but somewhere in your uh, lineup, if there's someone you can say is doing my job and they actively receive that, you know, now they get the opportunity to be interviewed while you're out. But no matter where I go, I'm always looking for, well, if I, if I go and leave, who do I put in my seat? Because certainly the organization, whether I'm here or not, they function. But who best helps us function? So I'm always looking for those sorts of, of things. And then when I have to actually leave, um, succession thinking is, is always helpful to have had conducted that before uh, the need arises. Okay, one more question. I'm going to take myself off stage. Okay. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Jeff, to pull me off stage here. Explain that last part a little bit about when you said the SCS community doesn't seem to be portraying.
thank you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's why I had said, said earlier, really read about uh, the SCS. OPM has a ton of literature. Uh, the SCS, um, what's the um, group? The... Um, but know that, yeah, Impo can give you information, but what's the uh, Seeing Executives uh, Association? I paid dues one year. I didn't, I didn't. So, so, and I wasn't the best active participant, so, so I'm not going to, I got to do better. But there are groups. Uh, let me tell you one thing I do. When I'm riding in the car, I listen to um, a podcast, and there's one F, the federal uh, radio system where they bring people in. They're actually having honest conversations about how things are. Um, but there's no dispute in the fact of two things you said. Living in D.C. is not inexpensive. The locale pay, um, you can almost look and, and, and see where these locality rates, they're indicators of something. So I agree with you. It's not, um, it's not inexpensive. But frankly, I remember when the TD position was open here at Port Wainimi, many years ago, I didn't apply out here because I can't buy out here right now. So those are phenomena in many parts of the country. Now, if, if you're mobile, can you even afford to buy where you'd like to mobilize too? So I respect what you're saying about, you know, if it's a one income household, those things are tough. I totally agree with you. Um, but no, I would say read on the SCS because you're hitting on something very important which is that the pay, uh, you know, it is the pay. It's, it's not uh, perhaps lucrative. So you don't get into the SCS for the pay. You probably join for other reasons, like the ability to influence outcomes and to get some of the results that are important to you. But it is, it is not necessarily um, the income. The income is respectable. Um, it's... Um, I'm, it's nothing that I'm unhappy about, but the reality is that, yeah, there's, there's probably um, more money to be made in some places. But uh, just, again, out of respect for what you're saying, I think you have a lot of valid points. It's not uh, inexpensive. The pay kind of is what the pay is, and the hours can be demanding. I agree with everything that you said. But now to get to maybe your point of how do you work through it, I think those become individual things, which is why some people don't aspire uh, to sit in those seats because they get the vantage point that you had through bridging the gap of seeing won't work for me at this stage in my life. And that's okay because maybe it's later. There's no age limits on it. So if you feel that, hey, maybe later, uh, maybe that's the right time. These programs that she just described, I think I had talked about it earlier, the programs absolutely give you a good vantage point as to whether or not you think you want to, to, to join the SCS, but then also when you want to join it. But then also, what other senior hard jobs do you want to, uh, to take part in and apply for? So um, hopefully I at least address, because I don't think I have an answer, I just have perspective on that one. So hopefully that was helpful. And um, I actually commend you because you're honest with yourself that based on what I've seen, you know, this may not be for me maybe at this time or I need to be deliberate about how I go about, you know, as I continue to strive. So again, hopefully I, I at least tried to address it. Probably didn't answer it though. Thank you. All right. I'm off the stage. <laughs>